Today, diplomatic relations between Ecuador and Mexico worsens. Brazil's Supreme Court opens an investigation into Elon Musk, and the IAEA warns of a potential major nuclear accident at Zaporizhia. From TLDR News, this is your daily briefing for Monday, the 8th of April, 2024. Ecuador has come under fire for a late night raid on the Mexican embassy of Quito on Friday which saw former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass captured, worsening a diplomatic standoff between the two countries. Ecuador's hardline president Daniel Noboa ordered police to force their way into the embassy premises on Friday night to extract Glass, who had been in hiding at the Mexican embassy since an arrest warrant was issued for him in December. Mexico-Ecuador relations had been shaky for a few months already, and tensions started really flaring up last Wednesday, when Mexican President Andreas Manuel López Obrador, or AMLO, suggested something very strange had happened during the election that brought 36-year-old Naboa to power in Ecuador. In response, Ecuador declared the Mexican ambassador a persona non grata, before then raiding the embassy premises on Friday. For context, Glass, who is now in a maximum security prison in Guayaquil, sought asylum in the Mexican embassy after prosecutors published messages suggesting he'd been released early from his 14-year jail sentence because a leading Ecuadorian drug trafficker had bribed a judge. Ecuador's government said in a statement that the immunities and privileges given to the diplomatic mission, which was sheltering Jorge Glass, had been abused and that his political asylum was contrary to the legal framework. Meanwhile, Mexico's President AMLO accused Ecuador of a flagrant violation of international law and Mexican sovereignty, and ordered the immediate suspension of diplomatic relations. A raid like this on an embassy is almost unprecedented, and over the last few days, several other countries have waded in to condemn the Ecuadorian government. In Latin America, Bolivia, Chile, Cuba and Venezuela have expressed outrage at Ecuador's actions, while Honduras called on the community of Latin American and Caribbean states to convene an emergency meeting. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres also said he was alarmed at the incident, adding that violations of diplomatic property jeopardise the pursuit of normal international relations. The incident does have some parallels, though, with the arrest of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy in London back in 2019. Assange had been holed up there avoiding arrest over rape charges in Sweden, before his asylum status was revoked by a new Ecuadorian government, allowing UK police to enter the premises and arrest him. Before we move on to the other stories today, a quick announcement. As I mentioned last week, we've been doing the daily briefing for a little over two years, and in that time we've really appreciated the support and enthusiasm of this community. This might not be the most profitable or largest TLDR channel, but we really enjoy the daily audience we've built here, of people learning together every day. So if you want to get more involved and help support the daily briefing long into the future, you might want to consider signing up to our new daily memberships. That's because if you hit the new join button, then you'll be able to sign up and support the channel for just $1.99 a month. In return, we'll feature all of our backers' names at the end of videos. You'll get access to a pool of Ben-specific emojis, which, if we get enough sign-ups, will also include stunning emojis like Wa Ben and Big Ben. <laughs> you'll get a little icon next to your name in the comments so everyone knows you're a fan, with the icon escalating in fanciness the longer you stick around. You'll also get priority comment responses with us responding to some of the members every day. You'll get the opportunity to submit your own uplifting stories, which, if used in videos, will also earn you a shout out. It's obviously entirely optional, but it's a little way to support the channel and fund TLDR daily into the future, so thanks for your support. Moving to Brazil now, where the Supreme Court has opened an investigation into whether Elon Musk has obstructed justice. Effectively, this story started when Supreme Court Justice Moraes ordered the blocking of certain Twitter accounts, including a bunch of right-wing Brazilian entrepreneurs, former politicians and digital influencers. This was an order that Musk himself went against on Sunday night, when he unblocked these accounts, going directly against the instruction of the Supreme Court. While doing this, Musk criticised Moraes in a string of tweets, saying that the order was unconstitutional and that the Supreme Court Justice should resign. As a result of Musk's actions, the court released a document stating that Musk had started a disinformation campaign and that X is committing an abuse of power in order to illegally influence public opinion. 
The court added that X shall refrain from disobeying any court order already issued, including performing any profile reactivation that has been blocked by the Supreme Court. Musk has also been added to a criminal inquiry that looks into digital militias. The UN's atomic watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, has raised the risk of a major nuclear accident after yesterday's drone attack on Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The plant is on the front line of the Russia-Ukraine war, and Russia has occupied the plant, which is the largest in Europe since early 2022. Whilst the plant stopped generating power soon after, it needs a constant supply of electricity to cool down its reactors and operate other safety features. Ever since the power plant has been caught in the crossfire of the war, the IAEA has repeatedly warned against such attacks, and it's still unclear who was behind the strike. In fact, both Russia and Ukraine regularly accuse each other of shelling the plant and risking a serious nuclear accident. For this particular strike, Russia has said Ukraine was responsible, but Kiev has denied involvement, and a spokesperson told local media that Russian strikes, including imitation ones on the territory of the Ukrainian nuclear power plant, have long been a well-known criminal practice of the invaders. According to the plant authorities, there was no criminal damage, but three people have been injured. The IAEA's head has condemned the attack and has stated that no one can conceivably benefit or get any military or political advantage from attacks against nuclear facilities. This is a no-go. Now to the UK, where a cross-party group of politicians are putting forward a new piece of legislation which would seek to decriminalise abortion up to 24 weeks in England and Wales, where, as present, abortion law relies on the Offences Against the Persons Act of 1861. This law outlawed terminations and is still used to prosecute women today. The amendment is backed by Stella Creasy, the Labour MP and abortion rights campaigner, and Dan Poulter, a former Tory health minister and doctor specialising in women's health. Other MPs who have signed it include Labour's Sarah Owen and Charlotte Nichols, and the Green Party's Caroline Lucas. The proposal is based on Northern Ireland's 2019 legislation, where abortion laws are less restrictive and decriminalised. A key element of this new legislation is introducing a lock to ensure that any future changes will continue to protect the right to abortion. For instance, in Northern Ireland, the Secretary of State, Chris Heaton-Harris, is directly responsible under the 2019 legislation for preventing a rollback in abortion access. According to Stella Creasy, England and Wales should follow suit, and have an MP to be held personally responsible to prevent attacks behind the scenes on abortion service provisions by those who oppose it. The cross-party proposal is seen as a less controversial and more moderate alternative to Labour MP Diana Johnson's proposal, which seeks to fully decriminalise abortion and allow women to terminate in the early stages by taking tablets home without seeing a doctor. In the final uplifting story today, we discuss the world's oldest man. John Tinniswood, aged 111 from Merseyside, earned the title last week, when Juan Vicente Perez Mora of Venezuela died at the age of 114. Mr Tinniswood was born in 1912 and has survived two world wars and a pandemic. He worked for Royal Mail, Shell and BP before he retired in 1972. While he doesn't have any specific advice for his longevity, he suggested that moderation and exercising the mind have been useful.